Awesome. Hi everyone. My name is Matt. So you might make a start. We have four talks, so we'll be quick. Um, my name is Has. Today I'm talking about uh, storytelling in Power BI. So a bit about myself. My name is Has Altaya. I'm a Microsoft Azure MVP. I'm based in Melbourne. I work as a director for Vnex, small consulting company. Um, we are also hiring if you are looking to move to Melbourne or you know somebody there, we'd appreciate the referral. Um, I also organize a number of user groups in Melbourne and a number of conferences and boot camps. So if you are interested in speaking or attending, please grab me for a chat after. Um, so before I start, I wanted to um, ask you to recall your best novel or story or a movie. Um, for a lot of people, it's Star Wars for some reason. Um, for me, it's something different. And you can see I have a lot of unfinished business with my um, childhood. <laughs> um, I want you to remember what was your favorite uh, story and what are the components that made that such a great story in, in your mind. Um, there must be something that made you really like that story or um, remember it, at least now when we are talking about it and you remember something. Um, so it turned out there are a number of things that make a story a really good story. Um, the first thing that uh, a lot of people talk about is a plot or a context. There is a consistent uh, number of cues that takes you into uh, a message that the author or the, um, the narrator is trying to, to convey to you. Um, and then, then there is obviously a clear message. Um, storytelling has been around for a long, long time. And uh, traditionally, it's used as a way of conveying um, values or retelling history or trying to give you a particular message. So there is a clear message. And then every great story has an element that appeals to our emotions and, and feelings. Um, emotions are not the same as feelings. Emotions is the physical state that's in the body. That's the chemical reaction and, and everything else. And then emotions is how our brain interpret those emotions. And that's great when you are telling a story because what that means is if you have appealed to the right emotions, um, the listener could remember your story really well and um, they will interpret your uh, results in a very positive way, depending on what emotions you have triggered. If you made them very angry, obviously they're not gonna interpret it very well. Um, but it's, it's really, uh, critical when you are, when we are telling a story that we appeal to to this and that's exactly what I'm trying to do is when I ask you to reflect on a great story that that uh, you know and then obviously there is the unique perspective so when we are telling uh, a story there is our unique perspective that we are trying to to bring uh, into the picture and that's the the author um, uh, unique point of view. And then obviously there is refining and retelling. As we refine and um, adjust our story every time we tell it, maybe the first time you are telling your story, it's um, probably a bit um, uh, edgy. Um, but then as you repeat and refine and retell, and that could be refining and retelling as part of the same story. As you are telling it, you're telling it in a variety of ways. So you convey the message. Or sometimes after retelling the story, you adjust and uh, it becomes uh, a lot better. <laughs> Um, so you might be thinking, okay, well, great, okay, you told me a few things about storytelling. How does this relate to Power BI when I'm trying to tell something about data? But there are a few tools and, and things that we can use in Power BI that could help us in building similar context or conveying a similar message or trying to appeal uh, into people's um, um, uh, emotions or pers per perspective. So the first thing is um, really using themes and templates. Themes are a really great way to build that consistency. Uh, we said that there are small, subtle um, cues that you would read in a novel, for example, and themes and templates give you similar things that you have a consistency across your dashboards or reports or uh, uh, whatever that, that you are building. So with, in Power BI, with themes, it's really simple. You can choose a number of, you can choose a theme from a number of built-in themes. Um, and if you wanted, you could roll your own theme. And it's really just four or five lines of um, JSON. Um, I will confess, I used to build uh, web applications and mobile applications. And every time I tried to make a design, it was really horrible. 
Um, so I would just I would I would ask you if you are not really into the business of um, good color matching, get somebody to do a professional thing. In many organizations, they would already have uh, 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 a standard uh, color coding that that you need to work with. And with these themes, basically, once you apply a theme, um, all the visuals will stay the same. But then you will see that um, the everything will adjust based on the theme that that uh, you have selected. And you can override based on uh, your preference for each uh, individual uh, visuals if you wanted to, but then that defeats the purpose of choosing a theme, obviously. Then the next thing is um, templates. Templates are a really good way of getting you started. So it gives you a, a landscape that's already uh, pre-populated with some of the reports. You plug in your data and then um, you get something that's um, up and running really quickly, but then gives you that consistency, um, which, is, which is really good. The next thing is tool tips and, and drill through. So imagine that you show this, this graph, it might be the number of sales or the number of hires that, that uh, we have made in the last year or something. And hopefully you have triggered that, that emotional um, uh, impact with, with your reader or your user, uh, whether that is a surprise, curiosity, uh, uh, a pleasant thing that, that, that you told them, maybe anger. <laughs> and, so with, with tooltips and, and uh, drill through, uh, the user can see more information as they hover and, and as they move. The one that we are looking at here is uh, tooltip, but then there is drill through. So basically you kind of click and then you, you go to the, the next report. The next thing is uh, buttons and uh, bookmarks. With uh, bookmarks, you can create a, a, a plot uh, with your uh, dashboard and, and report. So you can take the user on a journey on, you will see um, first a, a global view as we can see here, and then I'll take you on a view of by uh, regional level, for example, or I can take you into a, a different perspective. So you are taking the, the user on a journey through your dashboard and, and, and reports. So it's quite a powerful way to, um, uh, to present your, your dashboard. The next thing is samples and, and service apps. Uh, there are a number of samples that are available, uh, some of them for uh, financial, for retail, um, uh, fin financial, retail, human services, um, IT spending, and a number of other things. So I would really recommend if you are starting with something, don't start from scratch. Look at what's available out there because that would help you get started quickly. And you can also um, draw some uh, or uh, take some inspiration from what's there. Service apps is another really good way of um, getting started. So if you are trying to visualize things from Xero or from GitHub or similar services, there are already services that are out there with uh, content packed. So basically you plug in uh, your data and then most of the visualization are there for you. You can adjust and then you can publish. Uh, data story, data stories gallery is another good one that uh, you can uh, draw some inspiration from. There are a lot of um, reports that have already been published. Uh, this is an example of um, one story that's on Power BI uh, community. Um, this story tells the number of tracking, the number of deaths around the migration route uh, across the globe. And as you can see, not only it tells the story, but um, you have this green button where you could play the statistics pair uh, by number of months, for example, across the number of regions that are there. So I find um, Data Stories Gallery is really a good way to draw emotion, uh, draw inspiration on uh, what's available out there and what you can do. So in summary, the key takeaway, consistency and clarity is really essential for any um, good uh, storytelling. Uh, be human. Uh, emotions are a lot more powerful than, than facts. And if you are in doubt, look at the political landscape across the globe and you will, you'll get the answer. Um, uh, try reusing rather than starting from scratch. There are a lot of things that could help you uh, get started quickly. And take advantage of the uh, features that are available for you in, in Power BI. Um, here are a few links that, um, that are there if you are interested. And um, uh, here are my details if you like to connect. Thanks, everyone.
Hi everyone, my name is Negar. I work at Domain Guru in Data Platform team. And today I want to talk about design your SQL databases in a relational world. But first a little bit of history about a time when I was at university. It was a long time ago, more than 10 years ago. Uh, I remember that uh, at that time, object-oriented programming concepts were very popular. We, we learned at university that we can model almost everything in the world as an object. Uh, we were using UML diagrams for designing software systems to, and UML diagrams had tools to show relations like association, generalization, and um, realization, and these kind of relations. Uh, we had object-oriented programming languages. Those languages had tools to uh, implement those relations um, into the code. And on the other hand, we had relational databases, a pretty mature uh, technology that was around since uh, late 1970s. It was commercialized at that time. And uh, they also had tools like foreign keys, primary keys, associative tables, or uh, normalized forms of data, which help us to uh, store data for those relations into our storage. So in my mind, everything was uh, working perfectly, and they were matched together because relation was in the heart of both, uh, in heart of everything, like in heart of objects in our world, in, the, in our application, and in our databases. Few years into my career, I, real, I realized that software system can be very complex. At uh, any given time, we may reach the limits of our server uh, in terms of uh, CPU memory, or data may get too big, or um, calculation may get uh, too complex or costly. So at that time, we need to scale. And uh, one of the approaches for scaling is distributed system. And for distributed storage for our databases, the thing that we need uh, was partition tolerance. In a simple word, partition tolerance is, say, is saying that if you lose one of the partitions, you shouldn't lose your data. So based on Captorium in distributed system, uh, availability, consistency, and partition tolerance are three uh, vertices of our triangle. And at any given time, we just can have two of them. More, uh, mostly, a monolith RDBMS sits between availability and consistency. And if we need partition tolerance, we have to move away from them and move towards other technologies, no, maybe NoSQL. Uh, for example, looking into NoSQL technologies, um, we have availability and partition tolerance in technologies like DynamoDB. And we have consistency and partition tolerance in text like uh, MongoDB, HBase, and these kind of NoSQL storages. So if you decide that for your application you want to uh, move uh, towards NoSQL because of distributed storage, or you need to um, you, um, take advantage of how fast or how cheap NoSQL da databases are, should remember one thing. The world outside is still relational, and those relations still exist into our application. So we need tools to, and tools and knowledge how to implement those into uh, our NoSQL storage. <clears throat> but how? Um, I like to continue my talk with an. Um, simple example, but before that, I want to share with you four tips for designing NoSQL uh, databases. First one is to try to understand the business problem very well, know the nature of your application. If, know that if it's a, tran a transaction processing application or it's an analytical application or decision support system. For a transactional application, probably it's a good choice, NoSQL, but for analytical one, you should think twice before choosing this kind of technologies. Second tip is to define entity relationship model, because those relations exist, uh, still exist, and you need a tool to show them, like ERD diagrams, class diagrams can be useful here. Next one, uh, take a query-driven design approach. You should uh, identify your access pattern. In RDBMS, we always 
have take the class diagrams or ERD diagrams and start uh, creating that uh, normalized forms of uh, our data. And um, after creating our schema, we would assume that whatever questions comes from our application or our user, with the help of uh, that normalized form and with the help of joins and where and filters that we have, we could answer any question. So we design it and we assume that we will answer any question later. But for in uh, NoSQL, you should know all the questions first before designing uh, your NoSQL storage. Uh, for this step, try to uh, know uh, where clause, select clause, and filter clause of your queries very well. We will talk about it later. And the last tip is to try to keep the number of tables minimum, and that minimum number is one. A very bad design would be that you're getting the, um, after you design your ERD diagram, for example, you create one table per entity based on those diagrams. It's a bad design because you have to take if you have an application, <coughs> application sends, an, sends a query to your storage, you, you need to have uh, multiple trips between your query and application to answer that query. Especially these days with microservices uh, everywhere, so it's doable to have one table uh, per application service. Back to uh, the example uh, that I talk about. <coughs> I want to show you the design for a Design, uh, design of a NoSQL storage for a simplified online, uh, online booking storage. As you can see, it has four table, the class diagram for simple classes, customer, that can, which can have um, multiple orders. Each order can have multiple books in it. And between author and books, there, are, uh, there is a many-to-many -many relationship. So here we know that our application is a transactional. We know the class diagram, so tip number one and two check. We need to know our access patterns. For our application, we have, this, we, we have defined these uh, patterns for accessing the data. We want to get our books, customer, author by the uh, identifier. <coughs> Sorry. We want to get list of orders for each customer filtering by date, list of books in a specific order, list of book written by a specific author. And for a specific book, uh, we want to know who bought this. And for a specific order, we want to uh, just know that who is the customer that order uh, this uh, order. So the final design would be something like this, our table. But uh, let's see how we come up with this design. First, the access patterns that accessing the data by the identifier. We had book, customer, and author. For these ones, uh, we created partitions based on book identifier, customer identifier, and author identifier, as you can see in the first column. I highlighted those rows, uh, those rows uh, with, uh, like it, it, they are yellow. So the first column is the partition key for us. <laughs> Because our business is in a way that we can have a same email for author and customer, we need the tool to differentiate uh, between those rows. Um, so we created uh, some kind of sort key uh, with the values of customer, author, and book to differentiate between those items. And we put rest of the columns that we have in our select columns in attributes. So this is how we address this kind of queries. We have, uh, we define our table key and source key. The next one is list of orders for each customer filtering by date. For this one, uh, we should know that, okay, where is the where class here? Where class is our customer identifier. So we will go to the, we already created partitions for customer. We will go to the partitions uh, with the customer email, and because we want to filter by date, we will use date information as a sort key to um, index our items there and differentiate between um, different orders for a customer. The next one is getting <clears throat> list of books written by a specific author. Where clause is author, going to the author partitions. And uh, because we want to know about the list of books, we use book identifier as a sort key. Uh, the technique that we've used here is hum somehow composite key. We tagged our sort key with ISPN. So with queries like, uh, give me list of books for this author with this email. And, um, 
sort key starting with ISBN, for example, will get all the information back and getting the list of books. Uh, the next one, list of customer who bought the specific book. Because where clause are noun, clause is uh, book, we will go to the book, book partitions and uh, we will use customer information to, uh, as a sort key to uh, differentiate between those items. Um, until now, we just used the table key and sort key. We just had one index, simply. The last two queries is about a specific author. We want to know list of books in a specific author and customer who owns that uh, order. Um, so we should, go, we should have order partitions here, but we haven't created one so far. One approach could be instead of duplicating data and uh, creating partitions per uh, order, we use secondary indexes for that. As you can see in a column three, I've defined the um, order ID as a secondary index, and I use the books and customer identifier as a sort key to uh, differentiate between those items again. So we could answer all the queries that we wanted with just one table key and uh, one secondary index. <clears throat> to wrap up my uh, talk, I just want to repeat the most important tip, tip that I think it's important for when designing you know, SQL storage, and that's um, uh, th is this tip that if you wanna have a good uh, design for no um, for your NoSQL data storage, uh, you should know your uh, application access pattern very well. So that was it. Thanks for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. Hi. Right. Well, wrapping up. Well, I guess uh, majority of the room, he, uh, members of the room here, are already familiar with blockchain. Yes. How about AI? Yep. All right. Well. All right, are we good? All right, so let's talk about blockchain and AI. Okay, I'm Michael. I'm a lead consultant for uh, Telstra Purple. I'm a Microsoft MVP for Azure Blockchain. How cool is that? <laughs> All right, blockchain in three minutes or less. First, it's decentralized. Okay, so it's not a centralized database, right? And, you know, it, use, it actually uses a, a technology called distributed ledger. And the concept is that everybody has a copy of that ledger, okay? And technically, again, it depends on your implementation, but I would advise it shouldn't be on the same set of infrastructure. So you should be actually locked it on a specific cloud vendor, to be honest. All right. Um, second is that it's immutable. So um, it's tamper proof. Um, as a nat nature of distributed ledger, no one has the full control to actually change the record uh, once it's already in the ledger. And um, why it's powerful is that even if the party already or a party member already quits within you know, the consortium, the data still lives there. And new entry uh, in the blockchain will also have access to the history. Third is the consensus algorithm, okay? So basically it's the governance and how to ensure that everyone agrees that this is the record to be inserted in the blockchain, okay? So there, there are different um, algorithms. Um, famously, one is um, proof of authority, which basically means that only authorized members of the chain can actually insert records or verify a transaction. And probably the rest have only read-only access. Second is proof of work, meaning if you have the, the valid value or say a currency to actually sponsor a transaction, that's a proof of work. Um, third is proof of stake, right? Um, so proof of stake is about how much are you invested in that technology, right? So in my case, if we're talking about stake, I always wanted it to be medium rare. <laughs> All right, so smart contracts. So funny thing, smart contracts is not smart. 
it's neither a contract uh, nor a contract okay it's just a mere state management you know it's just a state transitioning of data okay so um what it means is that it's basically answering the question that on a specific state of that say a produce or an item who can actually you know manipulate or insert a record on that item right at, at what given business logic or business condition that's it that is a smart contract all right that was two and a half minutes all right so i'll try this in one minute okay ai ml and ds so ai in a, in a very simplistic term okay arguably very vague but it's very similar to you know a human brain in a way that it's about having logical reasoning self-correction and it boils down to either being a general AI or a narrow AI. So an example of a narrow AI is, for example, you're training an AI to be good at a specific game. That's a narrow AI. But if that's, that same AI can also do other stuff, then that becomes you know, general, general purpose. Machine learning, wow, in one minute. OK, so basically, it aims to improve or you know, it's about predicting or creating patterns or um, understanding, um, you know, patterns and anomalies. Okay, uh, there are different techniques around it. Okay, and machine learning is actually a subset or a branch of AI, to be honest. So, you can do supervised and supervised or reinforcement. Um, lastly, data science. Okay, so data science is probably you know more around the business side of stuff, wherein it's not just about machine learning. It's also about statistics. It's also about data engineering. And you know visualization, just like what has showed earlier, okay. And it's focusing on um, real-world complex problems. All right. So where does the battle begins? Well, the battle begins is that um, AI is more around you know probabilistic. It's about you know chances. Uh, however, blockchain is you know it's deterministic. Like everyone agrees, this is the record. So that's it. However, in AI, it's about, you know, hey, there's 95% chance that this, this data is accurate and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and with that, AI is about, you know, actively being, you know, doing prep and train so that it becomes more successful, it gets um, lesser uh, chances of failure. However, in blockchain, it's immutable. Just like I mentioned earlier, everyone already agreed that this is the record. Everyone vote. Someone already verified this, this is the record. This is truth. Lastly, um, AI is about guessing the reality. It's understanding the pattern, right? And um, however, blockchain is not guessing. It's about recording the reality. It's about consensus. All right, so here are some of the crazy, adventurous use cases that people um, I've met with uh, for the past three years talking about blockchain and AI. First is, why not let's create a bot that can host itself in the cloud and use a cryptocurrency to pay for the hosting? It could be in a form of a spyware that actually locks someone's machine, and when that person pays for it, it pays for the cloud. Or maybe it can create an artwork, or it can code for you, maybe. Second is um, automatic vote decisions based on people's personal data set. That's just plain you know, um, weird, right? <laughs> so um, basically, what's the point of having a vote if you trust the AI fully, right? Um, and lastly, other extreme automated outcome where decision and trust is just given right away. So example is judiciary. Would, because of existing data set of this person, would you actually decide that this person should go to jail or not? Oh. <laughs> All right. So personally, and this is where I'm really invested into in terms of AI and blockchain, this is for me what makes sense. Uh, first is um, if you've heard about Singularity Net, it's about you know a marketplace of AI services wherein you can actually um, buy some services, you know, leveraging say um, a very comprehensive AI model from another company. You can actually you know uh, purchase that and use you know blockchain as a form of community. Second, my favorite is um, actually my upcoming gig, something similar to this, which is about creating a pre-trained models on an I IoT Edge device, wherein these devices are actually members of the blockchain. So what that means is say you have a specialized hardware that's say, for example, in a supply chain, that specialized hardware have a pre-trained model to detect if an anomaly happens, say fire happened, or say a good you know, um, is under this temperature. 
So that you trust that this specific IoT device is part of the blockchain member, a blockchain network, and it can actually insert a record on the blockchain and it's verified. Um, lastly, is any form of enhancement in the consensus algorithms because it takes a lot of energy. It's such a waste of power in our world. And that, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vatsalya, and welcome to my talk, The Trust in Open Source Software. Open source projects are the crux of modern software development. We have encountered open source projects in some form or the other, even either directly or indirectly, whether it be building a front-end application in React, Angular, or Vue.js, building a back-end app in .NET Core, or even open source databases such as Postgres. Did you know that if you use the React CLI to create a new React app, you have 1.5 million lines of code that get added by new NPM packages, which now are in your source code and you haven't seen a single line of it without writing business logic. Well, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm a senior developer at Telstra Purple. I have been interested in so uh, software security for a while, since the start of my career, and I'm an avid proponent of DevSecOps practices. Um, also, you can find me on our socials here. I'm not sure why it's doing that without me pressing any button. <laughs> All right, uh, a bit about the talk. We'll uh, go through the software supply chain. The software supply chain is a way to uh, how developers think about building software on a very high scale. I'm not talking about microservice architectures. I'm not talking about domain driven design. It's just about how we think on a high level to build software. But then we'll go into attack vectors on how so vulnerable packages get into our solutions. And finally, how we can mitigate those and what we can do as the contributors or users of open source software. Let's start with software supply chain. Well, I'm not sure if you realize software development is really hard. We wouldn't have conferences like these if uh, software it was easy. We have multiple moving parts, the integration third-party APIs, we have to think about scalable design, scaling to millions of users, and finally, we have moving goalposts on what we actually need to deliver. Let's start with a simple application. I would like an application to where I can upload an image and it uh, sends out, uh, returns back a bunch of different images with different screen resolution sizes. What we want to do is focus on the cool, fun stuff, the good stuff that allows us to build that logic and serve our customers. But that's not really what software is, is it? You have the cool, fun stuff, but you also have the boring application logic that you need to build on every solution. You need to build controllers, APIs, security, and the really, really hard stuff that can go wrong, such as authentication and time management. So what do we do? We add libraries. That's a common way of going about it, right? We have some, someone's already solved the problem for us, so we just add that. Uh, we, have an app, uh, we have a library to solve authentication for us. We have a uh, library to manage and read images, uh, manipulate them, and so on and so forth. Well, those developers probably thought the same way as we do, is I have someone else who solved the problem for me. So I'll add smaller, uh, other small library packages, which get finally integrated. And as you build in that software, you have no, no idea how big that NPM block package is. Well, what happens if one of those packages is bad? Uh, you come down, you do an NPM install, and that tiny package that's hidden deep in your package lock file is gone. I'm vulnerable. I can start mining Bitcoin or cryptocurrency on your, uh, on your servers. <laughs> well, let's see how one of these packages can get in your system. We inherently trust open source developers and contributors. We've seen multiple cases where burnout is real. People say that I can't support this project anymore, but then there's an expectation on you as a developer, as an open source maintainer to go, you have to support this. There's millions of users using it. So what do they do? 
they say, okay, I can't support it, but someone else can. So please come reach out to me and I'll ha hand over the keys to you. One such example, event stream. The developer essentially <laughs> stopped maintaining it. They, uh, they said people are still using it. It had 1.3 million downloads a week. It's a very popular package in Node.js, but they couldn't do it anymore. So someone reached out. Someone said, hey, I would really like to support this. I would love this package. So can you please give me keys to a kingdom? So they gave them NPM uh, pub rights published on NPM and also repository rights to add new packages. So what happened? They, uh, they added exactly what I said earlier, a Bitcoin mining uh, script and 1.3 million users were suddenly affected when they did NPM update, NPM install in the production code. Similarly, Heartbleed. I think this was the first time where a very, very popular, cool name security vulnerability came out. It was essentially a vulnerability in OpenSSL's heartbeat check, uh, which was added on December 31st, 2011, after a couple of glasses of beer. That person went, I need to push this out. It's uh, mandatory. Uh, I'll push it out and, well, we broke internet communication and encryption. Typos coding. This is actually something I've seen in the industry happen a lot, where publish people publish packages that uh, sound very similar or spell very similar but aren't the same, and they'll add vulnerable code in that uh, repository and push it out. It only takes a couple of hundred stars on GitHub to, uh, for it to be popular, and people think that's a real, real thing. Sorry. So... What can we do about this? Um, SNCC is, a, I personally recommend SNCC as an open source database vulnerability management tool. It hooks into your package management file for any, for most popular languages such as Node.js, uh, uh, C-sharp, .NET, Java, uh, even containers. And it essentially says, okay, this is a vulnerable package, please update it. It also automatically creates pull requests for you, so you don't have to do it. As, an, uh, as a consumer of open source projects, also please look at maintainer activity. Do your due diligence before adding these packages into it. Don't just go to uh, 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 Node.js, NPM, uh, and just look at, uh, copy the command, install it, and good to go. Also try to see if these CVs, uh, if there are any CVs that have been released. If so, how quickly were they fixed? When was the last release of the project? As you can see for event stream, it was about a year ago. In the enterprise space, you can also perform a source code audit. It's a bit more expensive, but it works out really well. You can, uh, you can map the whole application tree. You can also do a proper pen test and inspect network traffic to hopefully not reach out and start mining Bitcoin and send it to some other servers. Also look at sources and sinks. Look where your, application, where your data in your application is coming from and where it's going. As a maintainer, as an uh, open source uh, maintainer, what can I do? Well, good news for you. GitHub last month announced that they are a CV numbering authority, which means if someone reports a vulnerability in your package, they will give you a CV ID and uh, uh, responsibly disclose uh, how to fix that and patch those vulnerabilities. They also release an advisory um, for you to essentially be, as a security researcher, identify and disclose that vulnerability to a, uh, to a maintainer, and then the maintainer can create a uh, advisory in the security section of their repositories. It's still in beta, but people have been trying it out. The way you can do this is by adding a security.md file in your public repository, which says what versions are supported and which what versions will get security patches. And secondly, um, how do I report them? Please don't let them create issues in your repository because that's the first way to get hackers allowed into your uh, into what vulnerabilities are there. So give them a PGP key. I recommend Keybase. It's certain. Uh, free tool that allows you to send encrypted communications. And then developers can then finally update and those then further prevent those issues. As an open source maintainer, you also have free tools. Defendabot is a good one for, uh, from GitHub. They purchased it about a year ago and it essentially does this very similar to SNCC, but it's uh, free for open source. So you can start and go ahead and start using it. It's very simple. You can go into GitHub, navigate to the main page. In the security section, just add automated security fixes. Uh, last week, I saw on GitHub, someone had a bot create a PR to update a package. A bot ran the uh, CI and ran the tests, and the bot automatically merged it while they were sleeping. So no human involvement, and you have security patches automatically in the solution. Well, that's the end of my talk.
Thank you and uh, have a good day.